Good evening. This is Chairwoman Tierra Booker Dwyer. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 19, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by me. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the March 19th agenda. May I have a motion to add an agenda item as item J, new business, special project request, Lansdowne Middle School STEM Center. All agenda items after this will be revised to reflect the correct item letter. So move, Lichter. Is there a second? Second, Hen. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Mr. Young? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. M motion carries. Dr. Rogers, are there any other additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no other additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing no additional items, the agenda stands as amended. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The summary of the closed session and the open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey. Superintendent Dr. Rogers and members of the board. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matter as presented in exhibit D1? So moves to Lusky. Do I have a second? Second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D2 and D3? So moves to Lusky. Do I have a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening, Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval this evening. Fiscal Officer, Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hen. 
Do I have a second? Second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Good evening. Our appointment for this evening is Michael Salkakis. Michael, please stand. He's attending this evening with his wife, Amy. If we can give him a round of applause. <laughs> Michael is being appointed to as the fiscal officer in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. With almost nine years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experiences include Fiscal Analyst 1 and Fiscal Analyst 3, Office of Budgeting and Reporting. Prior to that, his experiences include work with the Baltimore County Police Department, Driver Source Incorporated, C.S. Mills Logistics Incorporated, and Brody Transportation. Congratulations. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County's Police, Department, Home, De Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols, which are posted in the board room and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behaviors such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that time at the discretion of the board chair. I will now call on our school system affiliated groups to speak. Our first speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton with TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Ms. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Ms. Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. You have heard me speak many times about the need to reduce our workload for the educators. Our educators are doing so much more besides simply teaching our students, meeting social emotional needs, mental health concerns, often providing them with school supplies and even clothing. Our students need so much and our educators are there for them. I'm especially worried about our special educators. Their workload is even greater, and with state and federal laws, they truly must give more and more of themselves in their time. I'm grateful for the collaboration that exists between TABCO's Special Ed Action Working Group, affectionately known as SWAG, and Mrs. Myers, and the Department of Special Education. Over the course of this school year, they have met and worked to identify what could be taken off the plates of our special educators. And I'm happy to say that steps have been taken to reduce two specific items that will save our educators time, and there is work being done to address more. We are grateful for this. It's not trite to say that every minute matters to special educators. You'll be hearing from some of them tonight telling their personal stories, so I'll keep my remarks brief. But on behalf of TABCO, I wanna thank Ms. Myers for having her team work with us to lighten the load. There is still much to be done around this and we look forward to continuing the work. We need to do all we can to keep our special educators. Our students need them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. And Ms. Sexton is with the unions, not the school system affiliated groups. Next are our individual citizens and student groups. And our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron.
Good evening to all. Special thanks to Mr. McMillian for pressing the important questions last meeting concerning the operating budget. Also special thanks to Ms. Han for being persistent and persevering on questions and concerns regarding the operating budget. Special thanks to Ms. Maggie Adamowski for taking like five seconds before she voted, indicating the anguish and the thinking about it, and I truly appreciate that. Other board members were basically voting yes. We can't do anything about it. That's all the money we have. So in my 25 years, board members always done the same. From the time of Dr. Hirston and James Sassiadek till today, it's the same thing. We are really short, don't have enough money. We can't do anything about it. So I ask you, would you go to a surgeon that operates with 75% instruments or 75% staff? Would you? Do you think the US Navy or Air Force would send a ship east unless it is full tank and fully loaded with bombs and missiles? Right? You wouldn't. But we do that 25 years in consequence. So my point is that if you go to a physician and he gives you penicillin for 25 years and it didn't work, you would change that physician. Why doesn't the board change its treatment? You are doing the same treatment each budget and you have the same result. We are short, you heard Cindy, overworked, we need more staffing, etc. So here is what I propose to you in 35 seconds. I think the board needs to lobby the state and the county for levying taxes. The state and the county gives you that money, but you need to have an endowment. You need to have the public donate money to the system. You need to be able to levy the difference so you have adequate funding. Now, I lobbied for elected board long time ago and it went through, but I'm only one. I count on you to do that. Thank you. Ms. Sharon Seroff. Ms. Carly Delvine. Delvine, please correct me if I mispronounced your last name. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for your time. I'm Carly Delavine and I have worked as a teacher for the Infants and Toddlers program for five years. I'm speaking tonight concerning the unsustainable workload we face in BCPS. It has become nearly impossible to meet the needs of our families due to outdated systems, redundant documentation standards, a lack of resources, and ongoing staffing deficiencies. It's no wonder then that we have lost 195 special educators and related service providers in BCPS in the last two years. Those who decide to go into education do not make this decision lightly. We do not expect the job to be easy. We welcome the challenge. In my five years working in special education, I have learned that teachers in this county bond more often over our struggles than our successes. We have realized that if we mention concerns, they will not be addressed. We have learned that it takes bullhorns, posters, and red shirts to be recognized by the people making decisions that affect us. In my second week as a teacher in the Infants and Toddlers program, several coworkers began asking me, are you overwhelmed yet? It was a given. Not once has an administrator asked if I'm overwhelmed. Instead, we're thanked for doing the work while the expectations for documentation, reports, and assessments continue to rise. Furthermore, we question whether the administration knows birth to fives exists. 
Our program is shoehorned into a contract that does not acknowledge us or the unique obstacles we face. We are not included when the calendar specifies planning our professional days. Many of us do not have access to the internet outside the office, despite our need to access documentation and files in families' homes and on the road. As 12-month educators, snow day closures only include us when offices are also closed, despite the fact that our work involves driving to five or six locations across the district during contract hours. Case management is, not, is compensated for some, but not all. Um, and when K through 12 students returned to school buildings during the COVID-19 pandemic, the decisions made to protect the health and safety of teachers within their school buildings were not expanded to infants and toddlers teachers as we ventured to homes and daycares. For every special educator or provider who resigns from BCPS, there are more who are considering it. I choose to stay because I care about the families I work with and the future of their children. This choice becomes more difficult every day and I often wonder whether it is the worth the toll on my mental and physical health. I hope that you truly listen to the message my fellow speakers are sending and recognize that there are years of frustration, passion, and stress behind it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Christina Lanahan. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for your time. My name is Christina Lanahan, and I'm speaking as an individual. I'm here to advocate for our special educators. This is my 13th year as a special educator in BCPS, and I have also been part of the TABCO Special Education Working in Action Group for at least half that time. During my time as a co-chair of SWAG, we have op we've had opportunities to meet with members of the Department of Special Education on a monthly basis. I appreciate that DSE takes the time to meet with us and listens to our concerns, questions, and suggestions. I also appreciate that provisions were put in our most recent MOU to discuss ways to reduce IEP case management work. A few things were moved or lessened because of this. I wish those decisions had been made and approved during our meetings rather than waiting until we organize this action, but some change was made for the better. While we have started moving forward, there is still much more to be done to reduce the workload for special educators. This job is hard. Case management work is crushing. Let me give you an example. In the past two weeks, I've had to write six IEPs and two assessment reports. This is in addition to the five groups I plan for and work with each day, the time I spend supporting students inside of general education, and the time I spend collaborating with general educators. Being seasoned, I can complete paperwork at a fairly good rate, yet this paperwork has taken me a minimum of 18 hours to complete. <clears throat> That's 1,080 minutes, which is literally only for organizing data and writing documents. We have bar bargained extra planning time for special educators, which is wonderful, but in two weeks, that time adds up to 810 minutes. And that planning time is also used for actual planning and often for te testing. This year, we have already lost at least 37 special educators. Over the past two years, we have lost 195 special educators. Also, many of our special education positions are being filled by conditional teachers because we cannot recruit certified special educators. If you ask special educators why they're leaving, it's not the pay. It's because they are drowning. We are expected to do the work of at least two people with legal deadlines attached. I know this isn't a BCPS only problem. It's a nationwide problem, I get it. Desmond Tutu once stated, there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. So that is what I'm asking, imploring you to do. Be proactive, be the system that figures out the way to support special educators so that they want to come here and want to stay. Be the trendsetters that other districts want to emulate. Go upstream, stop the drowning before it happens. Thank you for your time. Ms. Beverly Folkoff. Good evening. Uh, my name is Beverly Folkoff. I've been a special education teacher in this county for 16 years, and I'm the 2023 Teacher of the Year. I am here today to ask for help and for a systematic change. 
over and over again, special education teachers have gone to the Office of Special Education to ask for help, and it's not coming. Instead, all we see is more responsibilities being placed on us under the guise of, it will only take 10 minutes. But it's 10 minutes per kid, and I have 10 kids I serve. This month alone, we have asked for two documents that are not required by law to be removed or lessened from our duties. But instead of providing a systematic answer that would support all teachers, we were told that individual schools can now make their own choices about these documents for their buildings, but with limited guidance as to how they should do it. Decisions like this create chaos and confusion instead of the help we actually need. I was diagnosed with a learning disability in the second grade and retained my IEP through high school. And I depended on that document to allow me access to the curriculum, and it worked. I graduated with honors from Towson University and then went on to receive a master's from the University of Virginia. I wholeheartedly believe in special education, its process, and I have proof of the results. But this process is coming to a crashing halt. My fellow special education teachers and I are tired. We are tired of being taken advantage of because we believe in the process and have been willing to do the work. We are tired of asking for help and being ignored or called lazy because we can't do the impossible. We are tired of feeling like failures because we aren't giving our students what they deserve, but instead are doing what we need to do to survive the day. We no longer want thank yous. We no longer want pats on the back. What we need is strong leadership and real change that will create a special education program that supports its teachers so they can support every student in this county. We are drowning in a sea of paperwork. We're tired of being thrown life vests. It's time to pull us out of the water. It's time for systematic proactive changes that change special education profession into a job that we can be proud to do. Thank you very much. Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening. I'm glad to hear my fellow special educators up here to say what needs to be said, and I'm going to cheer them on because that is what's going on in this county, unfortunately. The Office of Special Education doesn't want to answer anybody. Just, just recently, I had a meeting for a client who had to go out to do an outside evaluation. And that outside evaluation showed that the client was regressing. And the school's response was, oh, well, yeah, we can do something about it, but maybe, maybe not. I contacted the Office of Special Education to get some assistance, and the response I got was, the school will take care of it. If the school's the problem, who's taking care of it? I'm not going to say that these teachers don't want to do their job, because I've seen some very excellent special educators in this county. But if somebody is asking for help, the Office of Special Education should be willing to give it to them. And they're not. They're telling this, their teachers to go to their principals and their vice principals who are telling them, stay in your lane. When they come to a 504 meeting or a special ed or an IEP meeting to dismiss an IEP or to not test. There are a lot of parents out there who do not know their rights, who do not even know the process. And I've been working with a lot of them this year. And if a parent asks for an evaluation so that they can get their child services, they should be able to get it. And if a teacher is backing them up, that teacher shouldn't be afraid to say something because they're being told, stay in your lane. I have said something to this 
words several times about the culture of threats continues. It does. And it's right now, and the Office of Special Ed is not willing to look at it because the school building will take care of it. That's all I have to say. At this time, I will call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to address our special educators who are in the audience. Um, first, on behalf of BCPS, I want to thank you for coming out to share. I also want to thank Ms. Sexton, uh, TAPCO president, along with Ms. Myers, who have been working uh, diligently to come to some resolution. What I heard from you directly this evening was you talking about drowning in a sea of paperwork. Uh, we all know that federal and state guidelines require a lot of those paperwork, um, you know, make a lot of those uh, stipulations. But I also heard uh, you come to the table and you've come to the table with Ms. Myers and read some resolution in spaces where things are not required. Um, your request was that we have systematic answers um, that don't uh, leave a lot of uh, space for schools to implement in different ways. Uh, we know that implementation is the key to success. And so we hear your feedback. Um, we too are pleased. I, I thank you guys for recognizing um, out of the 195 educators, special educators that left Baltimore County Public Schools over uh, the last two years, there are 37 for this year, um, which points to us that our movement is in the right direction. But we hear you loud and clear that there's more work to do. And so I know that Ms. Myers and uh, Ms. Sexton will continue to work in that group, we will also um, create other opportunities for you guys to provide some specific feedback about suggestions that can be implemented across the system moving forward. Um, given our uh, elevation of special education as an academic priority that we're all focused on for the system, and as you see, the FY25 budget really uh, incorporating and recognizing the needs of special education pre-K through 12 in our system, I thought that it would be appropriate to depart from past practice and to share this uh, response to you directly. So I look forward to hearing more updates about the progress that's being made. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rogers. And please know to all the special educators, know that the Board of Education, we hear you as well. And we um, take what you have to say very seriously. It is a priority of us that all of our teachers have working conditions that are um, conducive to, to teaching, high quality teaching and learning. And we are working in partnership with the superintendent to begin to make those shifts in Baltimore County Public Schools. Next is public comment on board policy 0200, perceptions, beliefs, and values of Baltimore County public schools. And the first speaker is <coughs> Ms. Carly Delvine. No. Okay. Ms. Sharon Seroff. Nope. No problems. Dr. Bosch Ferron. Can I speak for all of you? No, we, we have some other speakers. <laughs> Am I speaking nine minutes in consequence? No, you're speaking on board policy 0200 for three minutes. Okay, not yet. Okay. Okay, now I can start. Policy 200. It has the word describing the public as uninformed. To my ear, I think it's heavy, uninformed. It means negative. I suggest that you would replace it with unknowing or unaware. It's more diplomatic, more easier on the ear. Next point is about the Oxford comma. I know I talked to you about it last time. 
I really enjoyed searching it. I learned what it is. I don't know if many people know what it means, but I learned something. I think the policy is not as good as other school systems. For example, Anne Arundel County talks about will master standards that are rigorous, rich, and relevant to the real world. I think that description is better than ours. And I really love that they say relevant to the real world. Our kids are going to face Indians, Chinese, Middle East, Finland, and Germany. I like an Anne Arundel County description better than us. They use the word equity lens. And I love that they use, operate openly and transparently with trust and integrity. Powerful words to be in a policy. Prince George's County is also good, better than us. I love that they say the board firmly believe, firmly believe, very strong and meaningful word. And then they say redistribution of resources to implement accountable reform. Again, they are talking about accountable change. I love in that policy, better than ours, that they say the Board of Education vows to close the achievement gap, vows, very clear and powerful word. And then they say that the board commits distributing resources equitably, effectively, efficiently, in the best interest of all children. I really love that clarity in all of them. Thank you, Dr. Farone. Our next speaker is Ms. Rebecca Fife. And it's, this is on the board policy 0200. Yep. Hello. Hello. So I'm a special educator with Baltimore County Public Schools. I was educated in Baltimore County Public Schools as well. It concerns me greatly over my lifetime to see how the county schools have changed so greatly uh, that the um, some of the teachers are still very concerned about students leaving school with the ability to read and write Ms. correctly. Ms. Ms. Fye, this is about board policy um, 0200? Well, you know, I, I was, I said that I was speaking, they pushed me over into 0200. So if you, I'll stop right here if you'd like me to. Yes, as right now we are taking. I the, did read the policy, and I was speaking about it. But do you, okay, if you have okay. feedback on the policy, that's what we're um, hearing it, now. It's fine. I um, I just I I hope that the board <coughs> will listen very clearly to public opinion and teachers because we have so much that could help you. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policy 1270, parent and family engagement. And the first speaker is Ms. Carly Del Devine. Okay. Ms. Sharon Seroff. I'm going to echo, echo the uh, last speaker, some of the words of the last speaker, by saying that my kids 
were educated in this county, and I have watched this county go downhill. And one of the reasons I think that this county has gone downhill is because the lack of willingness to engage families and collaborate with families. I come up here a lot because I hope I'm gonna be heard. And I will say that listening to the last meeting that I was not at, I think I do get hurt sometimes. Ms. Sarah, this is... I know. Okay. I know. Um, if you want to increase parent and family engagement, you have to make the board meetings, your website, and how you get information out more friendly. You need to have a website that people can find things very easily, and not that I'm spending 20 minutes trying to find something. And that's usually what happens. If so you, the recommendation to modify the policy to include website, a friendlier website? Friendlier website, making your board meetings friendlier. There's fewer people coming to board meetings for public comment. I, I've seen some times where I've been the only one on public comment or there's been one, there was like one person at the last meeting for public comment. So are you recommending that for the policy mm -hmm. to make board meetings friendlier? Make this county more friend, more willing to make, to be engaged with, the, with families. Because families are not feeling that way. And I'm looking at, I looked at this policy, and one of the things that didn't sh um, come out to me was that there's no special ed listed there. We need to talk about special ed, Title I, what our priorities were for the homeless, where are parents going to find resources. You need to engage parents by giving them those answers. And that's not in the policy especially for special ed. Thank you. Dr. Bosch Ferron. Pardon me, the policy has ESA, E-S-S-A. I really didn't know what is that. I know Prophet Isa. So suggest, <laughs> suggest that you would have a hot port to explain to the public what Isa is. And this policy also talks about supportive, uh, supporting parent engagement. How, how do you think that you are supporting parent engagement. I am an example, for instance. I am a parent. Do you think you are supporting them uh, by just inviting them, and that's it? Do you think you are supporting parents' engagement by not answering their email, or not really answering the presentations? Um, do you think you need to do a little bit more? Think of it, if you are McCormick Company or NVIDIA or Microsoft, you would do a whole lot better with the public than what public schools do. I don't see that. In page one and line 14 also, you talk about being ready for college. It gives the impression that your goal as a board, that for students to be plumbers, electricians, and go to two-year college. It doesn't mention university. It doesn't really mention um, about meeting the world as I mentioned in the previous policy. Then this policy talks about promoting and supporting engagement. That's line 16 and 17. So I like that wording, but I ask you, how do you do that? I mean, I am really an example. For instance, I ask for 
uh, engagement with the curriculum for 25 years, and I got very little, if any, all right? Um, the engagement outside, you have like 10 books about English, and I can't take it home with me to review it, for instance. Do you think me standing out there five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes is really a good engagement and critique of something you want to add to our students? Um, I have been here 25 years, and I can't get really much forward. And I'm not really costing you money. Three minutes, I don't think that engagement is really real. I think it is just really a word in the policy. I'm really surprised that the school system is not changing that policy. It's just keeping it the same effective way the way it is. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Farron. You can stay there. The next public comment on board, the next Next is public comment on board policy 1280, boundary changes. And the first speaker is Dr. Farron. Thank you, Madam President, Chair. Line 10, 11, the staff recommend no substantive change. And I'm really honestly surprised. So here is my, my thought. And I, I really thought of it a lot. For 25 years of me present here, it's the same thing. Schools are overcrowded. The policy talks about overcrowding. You change boundaries a little bit, and we are still overcrowded even with changing the boundaries, right? We, we talked about that before. So, you know, the policy is not really correcting the issue. It's still overcrowded. The teachers are already telling you they are overburdened, overworked. You know, they are short staff. So, you know, we are not changing the policy, and that treatment is not really working for 25 years. So this policy talks about quality education, equitable, inclusive education, etc. All right, my question to you as a board along the same line. How can we really perform as a system the implementation of these valuable and important words in education if we are short-staffed? If the county and the state gives us money and all what we do is say, we can't do anything about it, we can't levy taxes, you know, we'll vote for operating budget the way they gave us, that's it. You know, we can't do anything. You can't implement the good words in that policy with nickels and dimes. You need funding. You need to change the system. And if you don't change the system, this board is no different than Sassiadek board, no different than Arnold board, no different than any other board, just really managing. And I'm really sorry, I feel like Sometimes that I am a little bit too negative. I don't mean that. You gave me three minutes. I can't tell you how many positive things I've seen in the school system with my three kids, which is really the reason why I'm here, in appreciation of what the school system and the teachers have done many years before. But to fix something, you have to talk about the negative. You have to address it. You have to find different solution. You have to think outside the box and not use penicillin for 25 years and expect you are going to cure the infection. I hope you understand where I am coming from. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the Central Area Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary Recommendation, and for that, I call on Dr. Grimm. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. We are here this evening to request board approval of the recommendation of the Central Area Elementary School Boundary Study Committee. As a reminder, the purpose for this boundary study was to relieve schools projected to be overcrowded and to maximize use of available space in schools until additional seats can be added in the region through the capital program. 
At his meeting on February 27th, 2024, the board received for consideration the recommendation to approve option C2 from the Central Area Elementary School Boundary Study Committee. A public hearing was held on March 6, 2024 for additional public comment and feedback to the board regarding the committee's recommendation. At this time, we are requesting the board's approval of option C2 from the Central Area Elementary School Boundary Study Committee. May I have a motion to approve the Central Area Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary Recommendation as presented as option C2 in Exhibit G? So moved, Dominowski. Is there a second? Second from Paul. Any discussion? Ms. Teleski, and then we'll go to Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions um, just to make sure that the public is um, fully aware of the answers to these questions. Um, the first question is, um, there was a question about Harford Hills Elementary and Kearney Elementary, that they both feed into Pine Grove Middle, but they were not part of the study. So it would be helpful for the public to understand why. Thank you. The the cluster of schools that we identified for the study was larger than we had ever done. We had a lot of conversations. We made a, a judgment call about which schools should be included, which ones should not. And it, those just did not make the cut. I don't, we don't have any, um, there's no heavy reason why they didn't, weren't included. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is, um, the Cromwell Magnet Program, was there any consideration to move it to Jacksonville since Jacksonville was under capacity? Thank you. So is, is your question, was there consideration to move the, the magnet program itself? Yes. So any changes in the magnet program would actually have to go through the, through the board for consideration. So that was not considered as part of, as part of the, the task that the Boundary Study Committee had. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Pumphrey. Hi, Dr. Ram. At the um, public hearing, we heard from a group from Fellowship Forest regarding 22 homes um, that were moving, I believe, from um, to West Towson. Or maybe I got, do I have it opposite? Um, instead of Stonely. Unless I have it opposite. And my question is, their concern, that the concern they addressed is that that was unintended. Um, and that um, they, this move was spoken to at the, some of the community meetings. However, they thought they were left out of the switch itself and weren't considered. And I just, I think there was a question posed by, about that. I just was curious if that was addressed at all or if um, there was truth to that concern. Yes, ma'am. So we did, we did some investigation after those concerns were brought up in the meeting. I have some notes that I'm going to refer to because it, it does get a little bit um, complicated, if you will. So staff reviewed um, the following information, and this is about planning box 426 and 427. Um, it includes the Glenmont apartment complex and the single family hoods on Jacobo Lane and Ridgewood Road. Jacobo Lane and Ridgewood Road were not originally part of planning block 426 based on the subdivision data that we had received from the county. However, when we went back and took a look at this, it was determined that the reference area of, of Jacoby Lane and Ridgewood Road are part of Fellowship Forest Homeowners Association. So to include all of Fellowship Forest community within planning block 426, it would require mo moving Jacobo Lane and Ridgewood Road addresses to that planning block, which would be 426. This would move 24 single family home units from planning block 427 into 426. There wouldn't be change to enrollment utilization or demographics of either school as no K-5 to live attend students currently reside on those streets as of September 30th, 2023. So essentially, there was part of one planning block that included a, a neighborhood which falls under an HOA that was part of another planning block. To make that change would require a breakup of the the planning block, the way that it sits. So part of the planning block included um, a, a, an apartment complex and part of an HOA. The other, comp, the other planning block, 427, included um, all the other neighbors in that subdivision, which was the subdivision and not just the homeowners association. 
So are you saying the current map breaks that planning block or does not break that planning it block? It does not break the planning block. It, it breaks the HOA and not the subdivision as, it's, as the county has defined it. So essentially you have a neighborhood, there is a, another road that is adjacent to the neighborhood. They are part of the same homeowners association. They are in two different planning blocks because according to the county, they are in different subdivisions. And if we were to put those together, how would that change the demographics of the schools? So we, we research what would happen if, if if just the lane that was part of the homeowners association would move over, it would not have a material effect on the utilization of the schools. However, moving the entire block over would have, um, would have an impact. I don't think we looked entirely at the entire planning block because there's a much larger community within it. Okay, any? And this was the recommendation. It, it's our understanding, our staff went back and did look at, there was some discussion around this before the, the boundary committee made their vote. And it's our understanding that, that, that this was discussed at the, la at the last meeting and this is where the committee landed. Okay, Ms. Hinn. Thank you, and thank you, Vice Chair Pumphrey, for those questions. Um, I have a couple follow-up, Dr. Grimm, mm -hmm. for you. So to make sure my understanding is correct, the option C that's being at, considered by the board does not include maintaining the continuity of Fellowship Forest. Is that So correct? option option C2 does not include okay. Fellowship Forest as it's defined by the Homeowners Association as we researched after the meeting where that, that came up with the community. And in order to modify that, I heard you say that would not have a material impact on the, the enrollments. Should we um, change the definition of that planning block in order to maintain the continuity of so that development? So based on our investigation, Jacobo Lane, which is what's in question, Jacobo and, and Ridgewood, the 24 homes that are there would not impact the utilization based on the data that we have. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd D like to Dr. Make Rogers. Oh. a motion to consider that. And I know there's, there's a motion on the floor. Yes. I would move to amend the motion on the floor to make those changes to uh, maintain the continuity of Fellowship Forest. But we wouldn't maintain the continuity of Fellowship Forest. That's just one street. There's a much larger planning block. So I don't. And so, Dr. Grimm, could you explain that again? Because you're talking about one street, and that homeowners association encompasses, as I understand it, two much larger divisions. So if we're talking about maintaining the continuity, then we're looking at moving that entire, uh, everything that's encompassed in that homeowners association. Am I correct with that? So from, from our perspective, um, there's, there's two planning blocks. There's 426 and there's 427. The planning block 427 includes both these 24 homes in within the, the Homeowners Association for Fellowship Forest on Jacobo Lane and Ridgewood, and it includes a larger uh, apartment complex. If the, if the board did want to make a change, they could modify the planning block without moving it in its entirety. That's at the option of the board. So what, what our comment was is, that I think the, one of the original questions was, if we move the entire planning block over, what would the impact be? And that would be more significant, and it would go, it would be adverse to the decision of the Boundary Study Committee. So just to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, but to provide the board with as much information, since we did hear those public comments, we wanted to give you the information regarding what the individual planning blocks were consisted of as well as that neighborhood. Okay, so we have a motion on the on the floor Madam Chair, that we oh, oh go ahead, Ms. Hinn. I was going to modify my emo my motion based on Dr. Grimm's information that he provided. Okay, so we currently have a motion on the floor. What's your amended 
you're recommending? Just, your to, just to state it properly, um, and that is to um, redefine planning block. Is it 426, Dr. Grimm? I believe it's 427. Uh, 4, 427, thank you, to um, include Jacobo Lane and Ridgewood. You, I, I'm sorry, I hate to interject, but I think what you're trying to do, and correct me if I'm Please wrong, help me with the you're, try, you're trying to include Jacobo and Ridgewood in planning block 426. That's why I asked for clarification of which planning block they should be in to right. maintain so they that are, continuity of Yeah, they're currently the in 427, so you would be, you're requesting for them to move to 426. 26. Okay. Is that? Second Pumphrey. A sec okay, Ms. Pumphrey has second. Any discussion? Ms. Lichter. I know you probably said, I'm just trying to get this straight. So you said that they, as there was a discrepancy between the planning block and the homeowners association. That was the, dis there was. So, yes, ma'am. So when, when the planning blocks were created, Correct. We do that based in part on subdivision. So when we when we get the subdivision information from in working with Baltimore County Planning Department of Planning, the subdivision did not show that Jacobo Lane and Ridgewood was part of the uh, homeowners association that links Fellowship Forest together. Do so we didn't we didn't we wouldn't have that information that that is considered one community until after the fact. Okay. And so with the questions that we received, we went back and did research and confirmed that they are linked through a homeowners association. And I appreciate that you went back after we um, received the letters and the information. So are homeowners associations usually um, contained within planning blocks? Is that the norm that that that's some, if we're aware of the homeowners association, yes, we would try to include them in the same planning block. But we were not aware of this when the planning blocks were created and the information was given to the committee originally. That is, that is correct. Okay. And, and sometimes it's extremely difficult to include an entire homeowners association within the same planning block or designation because of its size or other geographic okay, factors. Right. My, my concern is I know the work that these committees do and it's very long and tedious to give us a recommendation. So I'm just trying to figure out if we were missing, if the committee was missing information originally based on this planning block versus homeowners association. So. And we, we understand that and we, our role is oh, to- I'm, No, it's not, I'm yeah, not saying anybody's fault. I, it's just if right. there was something that was no, missing- we, we, then like that's I said, we discovered this on, right. on follow-up, so. Right, no, yeah. it, that's yes, different than making a change just to make a change. If there was something missing originally, that's it. That's just, I need that clarification, yes, so thank you. And so just to piggyback off of what Ms. Lichter said, you know, I do recognize that the Boundary Committee, they put in a ton of work, and I am concerned with the, with the board making a, a shift like this without hearing the voice of the boundary committee and of the the community that's there i, I understand we had a public hearing um, but to do a change like as significant as this without including the community that um, was instrumental in the the identification of option c2 um, that concerns me and then i just also have a question about was there a, so the number of K-5 students that are in that area, how many is it? They're, they're not. Uh, according to the information that we had, um, there, there, wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be any impact right now. Right. Like the immediate impact as of September um, 20, 30th, 2023, there wouldn't be an impact. So there are so with this change that we are proposing, there there so there's no K five students in that block at all. Correct. Right now. And th those two streets, the Jacoby Lane and and Ridgewood. Right. So for so in those twenty four homes, there's not a single K five student. According to the data that we had from September 30th, 2023.
from the official M MSD enrollment. Yes, ma'am. And so we would be including these homes just for something in the future, perhaps. According to the according to the data and information that we have and the follow up that we did. Okay, Ms. Dominowski. If uh, this block um, or this road, the the Jacoby and the Ridge Road, are are they walkers to Cromwell, or not Cromwell, um, Stonely, or are they bus? Are they driven? Uh, honestly, we that's not something that we that we research, so I don't know that we have that information have right that now. Information. We don't. don't we don't. can't answer that right now. I, I don't have. We don't have that inform. I don't have that information available. Right I here. thought that was one of the things that we look for to make to keep the walkers in the same in the vicinity it, of this. It building. is a consideration that the committee looks at as they look at different designations. I can't answer for you whether or not this change would make them walkers or not. I, I can't answer that information. We don't have that in front of us. Okay, so is 426 a walking zone for, for Stonely? I, I can't answer that question for you either because I don't have that data in front of me. No, I know. Uh, uh, okay. 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 You're you're correct that those are consider the, those are considerations that the committee makes as they make as they look at the planning blocks and they decide what the boundaries would be. It but it would be disingenuous for Mr. Taylor and I to comment whether they're walkers or not because we don't have that data in front of us. Okay, and then this might go to Tierra, uh, Ms. Booker Dreyer. I know we have committee members here in attendance, and would it be in in, in no, this wouldn't be the time. Okay. Yep. So we'll go to Ms. Frumpong and then Ms. Pumphrey. Okay. So I, I have the, the map up in front of me with the blocks on it. So as it is in the recommended C2 map, the planning block 426 has six, and then PB 427 has 62. I just want to make sure I'm correct on those numbers and I'm looking at the right thing. Okay. So then we're saying, though, for those streets um, that are part of the fellowship, because they're zero, that's why the statistics are not going to change. So, um, you know, the demographics, the enrollment, et cetera, would still stay the same. But if we were trying to incorporate all of PB 427, that's when we have to take into account the 62, and that would have the large impact. Yes, ma'am. Okay, got it. Thank yes, ma'am. Ms. Pumphrey. Um, first, just only from my notes from the public hearing, it does state that that will make them in walking walkers instead of riders. That's just according to my notes. I know that's not official, but I wanted to make that comment. Um, also, I also recognize the tedious work of the Boundary Study Committee. However, I do it. I think it is the board's job to make tiny tweaks such as this when something comes up that may have been overlooked in the process. Um, and something small, not something huge. That's um, just how I feel about that part of it as well. And um, I think that's it. I think my Ms. Frempong addressed my question about the um, future enrollment. Any other, Ms. Hinn? And just to reiterate what we heard from staff, it is practice to try to keep these communities um, together when that information is available. Um, given that the Boundary Study Committee, and I, I admire their work and defer to them, on almost all of these, but this is a tweak based on new information, um, based on community feedback. This is why we have this process in place, and I appreciate the, the flexibility, the, the information provided by staff this evening to um, inform us. And this is not uncommon for the board to make um, tweaks as we receive information outside of the boundary process. So thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McMillian. Uh, Dr. Grant, obviously I don't live in that community. I don't know these streets. But these two particular streets you're speaking of, where do those kids, if there were any kids, where would they currently go to school? Take me a moment to figure it out. Let me, let's see if we can get you that information. I'm not sure whether it's... Um, uh, West House or Stonely. So let me get that information, Mr. Taylor. Yes, sir. Look, search on the map. Any? 
believe it would be Stonely, but we want to check to make sure. It looks right. Okay. So with, okay, so Stonely. So with this amendment, they stay at Stonely, or they now, if there were any kids, they would go where? Uh, they would go to West House. If there were any kids. Okay, thank you. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Just one quick point of, um, just to make sure that I'm fully understanding. I know you said that when a homeowner's association is extremely large, that would be a time where it would be hard to keep the planning block together. Do you know about the size of um, the Fellowship Forest Homeowners Association? Is it small enough that it would be reasonable to try to keep the community together, or is it, um, you know, just relatively too large to do that. Thank you. And I don't know if you have that information, but. So, uh, and again, uh, from, our, from our point of view, um, as coordinators of the process, we are here to provide that information. I think that's a threshold that becomes a, a judgment or a recommendation call. Um, in, this, in this case, as I said, we did find after the fact that they are tied, these two, these roads are tied together as part of the homeowners association. Um, they, they do not appear, if you look on a map, they are, um, they are not connected by uh, another through road. They are in different subdivisions of the county, um, which, which is a differentiator. However, like many other neighborhoods in Baltimore County, they are brought together by um, a homeowners association. If you look at them on a map, um, they are together, they are uh, in close proximity to one another, and they sit near um, another community, which is largely an apartment complex. Thank you. Any other questions? May I have a roll call vote? This is we're voting on the amended, um, we're voting on the amendment the, to redefine planning block 426 to include Jacob, Jacob Lee and Ridge, Jacob Lee. And Ridgewood. Okay. Couldn't re read my own handwriting. Ridgewood. And Ridgewood. And Ridgewood. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Sorry. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. So, noun. We vote on the motion as amended. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Did we just vote on? We voted on the amended motion. Option C2 is amended. Right, so we're going to, so, so right, so C2 then th this is the vote to adopt, to actually adopt the C2 map as amended. Okay. Okay. All right, am I good over there? Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is new business report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that, I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation of proposed changes to the following board policies. Board Policy 0200, Precepts, Beliefs, and Values of the Baltimore County Public Schools. Board Policy 1270, Parents and Family Engagement. And Board, board Policy 1280, Boundary Changes. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibits H1 through H3. May I have a motion to accept the recommendations, the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for board policies 0200, 1270, and 1280? So moved from Paul. 
Is there any discussion? Ms. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a question for Vice Chair Pumphrey as chair of the committee, and that is, um, did the committee consider the other LEA policies on this in the discussion um, or discuss any other um, language you liked from those policies in considering it? Are you referring to a specific policy or, or all three of them? Um, the other linked policies that were included in the document for other LEAs as part of the analysis. I'm sorry, 1270. Give me just a second. Sorry about that. Looking at the policy, give me just a second. I believe for this particular policy, um, I mean, we're, we're all provided, of course, with the analysis in advance and prepare for the. I don't recall any discussion about any specifics in the, in the actual meeting itself for this particular policy. Okay. I'm looking at the correct one. Madam Chair, may we separate 1270? I'd like to make a motion to send 1270 back to committee for further discussion of the other LEA policies to see if any other recommendations could be made based on public feedback we heard tonight, based on the fact that community engagement is a priority for the board and superintendent. We may have a motion to move all of the policies back. Let's go around through discussion and then come through the, the, the to the motion. Okay. So, yes, because I have some questions about the policy, um, and we can start with policy 0200. The guiding principle, so, so we're requesting that the superintendent implement these policies. And when I read over these policies, I'm just, I'm not clear how, how, do, we, how do we know that they've been implemented effectively? So when I look at a statement like, we respect the worth of all individuals, I don't, I don't know how, what is the rule that would be developed to measure, to do that? Or when I look at, um, we strive to be our best. What, I, I, so it's just, it's some of the language in um, the policy 020 that I do think can be strengthened so that it's a clear connection to if we're gonna develop a rule, if the superintendent's gonna develop a rule and then we're gonna hold the superintendent accountable for implementing. Um, but right now, I do feel like it's, it's a little, the, the, word, the words could be a little stronger. Uh, Ms. Pumphrey, yes. So there is a rule, it's rule 0200. Um, I think a good way to look at rule and policy for me, when I look at it to try to tell the difference, the rule is implementing the policy. And when we think of our role as governance and as overseeing, that's what policy does. The rule itself is getting into the fine details of implementing the policy and the operational part of that. Um, so uh, you can refer to the rule to see how it is implemented. As far as um, metrics, so I, I, th I feel that they would also follow the rule, not necessarily the policy. So you're really looking for the details in the rule itself, because that's the implementation. Our governance is the overview of, and the policy itself. In other words, the, um, the what we want done is in the policy. The how we do it is in the rule. Right. So if what we, but what we want done has to be clear enough to develop a rule that's sharp enough so that then we can, because we're, if we're looking to really shift some things in Baltimore County, it starts with the policy. And so the policy has to be shaped in a way that a rule can be crafted so that there could be some accountability to that rule so that then the board can hold the superintendent accountable for implementing it. And right now, just the way, the, the way that this policy is crafted, I don't know, uh, you know, with respecting the worth of individuals or um, we believe in the importance of public education. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure if it, it just, this doesn't feel as though it's a, I don't know what we're trying to get at here with this policy. What is it that we're actually trying to govern here? How do I govern that we value, we respect the worth of all individuals? What does that, what does that look like? And so that's just my concern, overarching concern with, um, it, at least, and I'm just using policy 0200 as an example. Ms. Frimpong. So again, to um, reiterate what Ms. Pumphrey is saying, a lot of the things are how it's done is gonna be done through the rule. So I actually have the rule pulled up. And so if you look at rule 0200, um, first of all, it talks about the purposes, it's gonna implement, implement the policy itself. And then it starts getting into, employees are gonna have access to training and resources supporting these precepts, beliefs, and values. 
um, we're going to be incorporating that into all of the school systems onboarding programs for new employees. So those are examples of how um, that's going to happen or how it's going to be measured. But again, that's on the that's on the rule side. And I think it is sometimes a challenge when the policies come up before us as a board and may almost feel that it's incomplete because you're not seeing that big picture. So in order to see the big picture, you really do need to take the policy in collaboration with the rule. Um, and so that's you know just my points on that. Yep. Ms. Hinn. Thank you. Um, so I hear what my colleagues are saying regarding the rule containing the operational implementation. But Madam Chair, I also agree with what you've said regarding there being an opportunity for the board to provide some more specific um, direction and visioning through the policy that then guides the rule. And the example I was looking at was with policy 1270 um, number two standards. There are some very general standards around how we engage with our communities and families um, that this board should review and take a look. The, do those standards still align with our priorities? Can we be more specific? I agree they need to be measurable and that the details can be implemented in the rule, but it starts with setting a policy that has um, concrete deliverables that are more than feel good language, something that we can use for accountability sake to hold ourselves and the superintendent accountable for those. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just go to an example with policy 1270. When I look at the uh, board's vision, the board's goals, are these the same vision and goals that are in our, that we're looking to have overarching or do we have a separate vision and goals just for parent and family engagement or do we have, are these, what I'm questioning is, is this the right language for the policy? We have one overarching vision, overarching board goals so then what are we trying to say here? Are we, we're now introducing a new vision and goals. So, so that's where I'm, I have some questions. Yes, Ms. Rimpong. So I guess I have a question for Ms. Hen because listening to what you, deliverables, what does that look like then when we're talking about governance? I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm clear on what you're looking for. May I respond, Madam Chair? Oh, yes, Ms. Hinn. Thank you. Um, so I think that might lead into another discussion um, in terms of accountability and evaluation and, and our role, which is um, outside of the scope of this discussion. However, the policy guides the rules and guides um, implementation without containing those operational details. Um, there's some room for definitions. There's room for realignment or review of the alignment, as um, Madam Chair said. Are these um, still current? Do they still match with the board's current priorities? Um, so review. So I would, if Madam Chair would entertain a motion to send these three policies back to committee for further review and discussion or to a committee of the whole. Um, I'm not sure what you were envisioning next steps would be, but I would support that. Okay, let's hear what Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Chair Booker-Dwyer. Um, I think uh, just to share with the full board as well with the community at large, um, we should give Ms. Han and Ms. Onijala an opportunity to come forward to the dais. Uh, they can speak specifically to policy 1270, <laughs> what those uh, specifics are to um, just provide some more context yep. holistically we help? to the board. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. <clears throat> I am Susan Hahn with the Office of Family and Community Engagement, and I appreciate all your questions. Um, as a central office staff member, the policy is the sy systemic view, and um, in partnership with Title I, each school has a, a compact, so each school is doing this work in the school level and your policy is for the system to include all schools. We also developed a system, Title I and system-wide family engagement plan because just Title I schools should not have a plan. So that plan is in all schools. And met, much of this policy and rule is connected to ESSA. And so a lot of the requirements of ESSA actually do guide our rule and policy, or your rule and policy. Your rule and your policy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I would just add also, um, 
and someone had asked specifically about benchmarking with other systems. I think that's best practice across the board when we're um, talking about reviewing policies and making updates that we're looking at what other similarly sized districts are doing, incorporating some of the really good things that we see there. And then also just another layer, we've been before you before to talk about um, our work around the strategic communications plan for the system, which also includes a lot of the work with family and community engagement. So there are through lines in everything that we do. Um, um, and just to reassure you that these are things that we're very thoughtful about in looking at how all of those pieces come together at the school level and at the central level. And you did bring up um, accountability and assessment in, in a sense. Family engagement has always been very difficult to get evaluation of, um, but we have worked really hard the last couple of years. Every single event we attend, every staff professional development we give, we include policy 1270 and that family engagement plan so that all our staff who are our messengers know about this plan and this policy and can share it with families. And so um, we are looking at all evidence-based family engagement practices and implementing them too as we possibly can. Okay, any Go ahead, Ms. Pumphrey. Nothing else for that particular policy, but I wanted to mention something about, um, excuse me, 1280, so I don't know if Go you ahead. want me to do that now. Yes. I just wanted to point out that we did have a thorough discussion. It's in the analysis and made some changes in PRC for 1280, and it's under um, the background PRC and board action dated February 5th, 2024. I just wanted to point that out to the rest of the board. <coughs> okay. Okay, Ms. Hinn, you can make your motion and see where it goes. <laughs> okay. Yes. So there's already a motion on the floor. So so the I know Ms. Hen had originally made a different motion. So it, it, there has to be an amendment request here. So we can't make a new an, an entirely new motion, which is what it was sounding like. So we need to just make sure there is there is an active motion on the floor. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I will withdraw my last motion, which I don't remember what it was anymore after this discussion, um, and we'll make a new motion to amend the motion on the floor to, re to consider these three policies after further discussion by the PR by PRC. If that, if that sounds like a different motion, I'm to giving make a, a mo it's So you want to make a motion to amend to recommit and to strike the original motion um, where it was going to approve the three. Um, I'm sorry, let me look at your original motion. Um, so to make a motion to amend instead of to accept the recommendation of the Board Policy Review Committee to recommit um, the Board Policies 0200, 20, 1270, and 1280. Yes, thank you for that assistance. So to strike the original motion and to recommit policy 0200, 1270, and 1280. You're just striking the You're word striking. accept. To strike just the word accept? And, and, okay. to, re and, to, and, insert, and to reject the recommendation. And, and then we're gonna add to, to then um, to recommit. Okay, so move to amend to strike the word accept, add the word reject. Strike the word. I'm sorry, to insert, to insert reject and to recommit. And th th that'll and be fine. And then that's you guys plenty. Next, and then you could do your and next motion. And then we'll motion. move it back to Pierce. Okay, as a separate motion. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor to, to strike the word accept the to, to strike the word accept the recommendations of the board policies to insert. and insert and reject. Insert, yeah. So may I have a motion to strike the word accept and insert the word reject? So moved. Wait, so we need a second. Wait, so we need a second. Second Okay. Um, is there any discussion? Ms. Lichter. And the purpose of this is for the committee to 
redo the work they already did or to take in consideration? What, what is the, why are we sending it back is my, is my question. It's, or why are we rejecting all the words? Why are we saying, we're basically sending it back, correct? And so I do think there are some specific modifications that are needed. So for example, policy 1270 to um, align the, the vision and goals with the board's vision and goals. So we're um, for like policy 200 to strengthen the guiding principles, um, especially the, to strengthen the language and the guiding principles so that as a board we can see that, so that we could see the through line for the governance. Okay. So it's to take into consideration the feedback of the board tonight and public comments. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pomfrey? No. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Favor is six. Motion does not carry. So I'll go back to the original motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for board policy 0200, 1270, and 1280. Uh, it, any discussion? Go ahead, Mr. McMillian. So if we vote this down, does that mean it goes back? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Dulesky? Oh, no, okay. No comment, thank okay. you. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Dominowski? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Favors four. So motion does not carry. So what happens now? So it goes. So they just they just stay until the next time. The, the next cycle of, <coughs> so the policies will stay as they are without the modifications that are included. So they'll go back to their original state. So if you want, you guys can make a motion to recommit them back to the policy committee at this point. Okay. So we can make a motion to recommit them back to policy committee. Yeah, that was. Ms. Hinn. So moved. Is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Is there any discussion? I'm gonna mess this up, but I, I would like to separate 1270. So you are? I, actually, yes, I, wanted, I would like to separate 0200 and 1280 and vote on that separately from 1270 as far as recommitting. So you would like to amend the motion to only send Zero. One, two, seven, zero. Madam Chair, I, don't, I believe we don't need to separate to change the motion. We can vote on them separately with the motion that's on the floor. Yep. Yes. Okay. What is the motion on the floor? To recommit. To recommit. Policy. Okay. So let's, we'll do it one at a time. So, um, so do I have a, so we can do it. Okay. So May I have a motion to recommit policy 0200 back to the policy review committee? So moved, Stileski. <coughs> Is. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Is there. Well, may I have a roll call vote? This is 0200 to go back to committee. Who moved it? I'm sorry. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. 
Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Favor is six. Okay, so it doesn't, it stays as is. So may I have a motion to move policy 1270 back to the policy review committee? So move Stileski. May I have a roll call vote? <coughs> Do we need a second? May I have a second? Second. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dreyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. May I have a, mo a motion to move board policy 1280 back to the policy review committee? So moves to Lusky. Is there a second? Second. May I have a roll call vote? I have a point of clarification oh, yes. here, please. If, if the, we vote no to um, recommitting this, the changes that are currently there, there will not stay, correct? The, current, the changes made by PRC? Okay, thank you. you. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay. The next item on the agenda, we're done with this, right? Okay. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call on Ms. Devasti Jones. Good evening, um, Madam Chair and Dr. Rogers and members of the board. Um, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render a decision in case numbers 2023-2024-07 uh, and 2023-2024-06. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the action taken in closed session. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on case SD 2023-2024-06 in which no argument was requested and authorized Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not present? So move, Pumphrey. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on case SD 2023-2024-07 in which no argument was requested and authorized Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not present? So move Stileski. Is there a second? Second from Paul. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Abstain. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the report on proposed public charter schools. The first report is on bilingual global citizens public charter school. And for that, I call on Dr. DiDonato and Ms. Casey Kirk. Oh, wait, 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 let's pause. I just need to refresh. <laughs> 
Okay, we're actually going to modify this. So the next item on the agenda is that is the newly added business a special project request. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm. And so Dr. DiDonato and uh, Ms. Kirk, you will be after this. All right, Dr. Grimm. Good evening again, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. <clears throat> I am here this evening representing and in partnership with the Division of Schools and Division of Curriculum and Instruction to request board approval of a privately funded project for a STEM center at Lansdowne Middle School. The Cal Ripton Senior Foundation is poised to donate STEM materials, furnishing, signage, equipment, training, and a wall wrap as part of this privately funded project. In alignment with board policy and superintendent's rule 7330, capital projects funded by private donations, BCPS staff have reviewed the documents for this initiative and recommend it for your consideration and approval. May I have a motion to approve the special project request for Lansdowne Middle School STEM Center? So moved from Paul. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Mr. Lusky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? I did have a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. McMillian. I'm just curious how this original contact was made with Ripken. Did the Ripken Foundation reach out to us or we reached out to Ripken? How did that take place? So I believe that the, the Ripken Foundation and BGE Exelon reached out to the, to the school system. This is an initiative that will be spread not only in BCPS, but across the region. Um, Ms. DiNonato, Dr. DiNonato, it, it I think it's something like 80 schools when they're complete, is that correct? Yes, so the Ripken Foundation in partnership with BGE Exelon um, received a grant through MSD, so they're installing and seeking to install um, STEM centers in schools across um, the state of Maryland, and especially for BGE and, e and Exelon within their uh, operational area. And they identified Lansdowne Middle as one of the schools that they would like to partner with us. Um, currently, Lansdowne High School has a strong relationship with BGE and, e, um, and has several uh, students who uh, do apprenticeships and internships there, and they've actually hired several of our students out of high school. Um, so they wanted to sort of increase their partnership by uh, branching into the middle school. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Dominowski? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing the new STEM Center at Lansdowne Middle School. Okay. Now the next item on the agenda is the report on proposed public charter schools. The first report is on bilingual global citizens public charter school. And for that, I call on Dr. D. Donato and Ms. Casey Kirk. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Ms. Pumphrey, and Superintendent Dr. Rogers, as well as other board members. Um, tonight we bring to you, in accordance with BCPS Rule 1600, a report and recommendation for the new charter school application submitted by the Partnership for Infinite Education for the Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kirk, um, our Supervisor of Special Projects. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. DiDonato. This slide summarizes the introduction and purpose component, component of the report. After receiving and evaluating Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School Letter of Intent and related prospectus two years prior to their anticipated opening, the BCPS team evaluated the information based on BCPS Rule 1600 and approved the organization to move forward to the application stage. The application was submitted on January 2nd, 2024. After a technical review, a BCPS team of 23 content experts was convened to review the formal application. The final stage of the process included a one hour virtual interview and opportunity to provide written responses to the interview questions. Next slide, please. This slide outlines the qualitative review process. The team used the scoring tool for a charter application, which is publicly available in BCPS Rule 1600, Appendix D. As you can see on this slide, the tool has four main sections and 28 subsections. 
Next slide, please. This slide provides a summary of Section A, the overview of the application review. Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School is proposing a K-8 dual language immersion school on the east side of Baltimore County. The languages that the charter school plans to teach are both Chinese and French with two classes, half day Chinese, half day English, and then half day French, half day English. The school intends to open with grades K through three and then adding one grade level each year for subsequent years to end with K through eight. It is noted that all affidavits will need to be signed by all members if a decision is made to approve a contract. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. DiDonato to discuss Section B. Next slide, please. So the next three slides will provide an overview of the educational plan summarizing uh, key components that were included in the charter school application. The bi Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School application describes a dual language immersion model driven by curriculum that's aligned with the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards and detailed the many supporting documents that accompany the application. The organization utilized ed reports to identify high quality instructional materials and the professional learning is aligned with research for better teaching. Next slide. The special the special student population section generally highlights the identification process for students with disabilities and speaks generally about supporting students with disabilities and students who receive ESAW services. More explicit plans to support students with alternative educational frameworks is desired. It is noted in the application that some of the charter school board members have prior recruiting experience and have already started surveying the community in the area which they hope to establish their school. The school's code of conduct is detailed and aligns with BCPS policies 5550 and 5560. Next slide. Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School submitted several waivers to be considered as part of their application in the areas of school calendar, student assessments, and interviewing and hiring new staff. Several, several questions during the interview phase of the application process were related to these waivers. The organization addressed those without, uh, with concerns and questions in the interview and subsequent written responses. Part of the uh, details on the slide identify those specific waivers, um, specifically looking at a waiver for um, map testing and BCPS, um, given the other assessments that would be conducted with a bilingual um, education program. Next slide. This slide provides a summary of the organizational plan details um, in the charter school application. The application demonstrated clear organizational and reporting structure and a robust plan for partnerships designed to positively impact student learning. As was discussed in the interview, it's important that the organization, if approved, have a robust plan for recruiting teachers, especially considering the specialized teacher qualifications aligned with their bilingual mission. Next slide, please. The final section of the application review is the business plan. While the budget described in the application is realistic, the fact is that their uh, building has yet to be secured um, does present a financial risk that was noted. Because Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School plans to use BCPS nutrition services, the organization would also need to account for the purchasing of related equipment aligned with BCPS standards. At this time, I will turn the presentation back to Ms. Kirk to discuss the interview phase. Next slide, please. Thank you again, Dr. DiDonato. The interviewers found that the Bilingual Citizens Public Charter School was well prepared for the interview and each member was, each member was intimately familiar with both the plan and the school's mission. As was discussed in a previous slide, the need for more details related to plans for special student populations, and that was an outcome of the application review. As such, a sizable portion of the interview, as well as the written responses to the interview questions submitted after the interview, were devoted to this area. I will turn the presentation over to our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. DiDonato, and Superintendent, Dr. Rogers, to discuss the recommendation. Next slide, please. On this slide, you'll find the recommendation that was made to the superintendent from the Charter School uh, Committee. Um, the Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School is recommended for approval to pursue a, con a contract in BCPS with the following contingencies. 
secure a facility that meets standards and is approved by BCPS Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning, provide identified requisite documents such as a certificate of good standing. Um, we would also strongly encourage them to work collaboratively with our Office of ESOL and World Languages, given the components um, of their instructional program and looking at the progression of students as they move from a bilingual immersion program um, at the elementary level into our middle and high schools. Okay. Any questions from the board? Mr. McMillian and Ms. Lichter. Realistically, how do you go about finding a, the funding for a building? So the charter schools use a variety of um, either grant funds um, for funding of buildings. MSD has public charter school grants also. Um, there's also lots of private partnerships that our other charter school has identified, and that's how they uh, were able to secure their building. Now, Waterview was an old Catholic school. Is that a parochial school? Watershed. Watershed, yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Lichter. I, I, it might be in here, I just can't remember. How will students be selected to attend the charter school? The charter school would go through a lottery process, okay. which is same as Watershed. Okay, so no testing, no interviewing of kids, just as pure lottery. Yes. Because there was one question that said, will all um, children, um, e ELL, I'm not using our right terminology. Will all, where is it, ELL students be provided a place? Here it is. Will all ESL students who applied be accepted to the school? And says the answer is yes. So how does that work with the lottery? The I believe that the English language learner component is not considered in the lottery process. And the reason that the special population was chosen due to the fact that it is an immersion school. So they would not only be learning French and or Chinese, they would also be learning English at the same time. And it was really important that our Office of Multilingual Learners was involved in the interview process. And that is part of our recommendation to move them forward is to make sure that they continue to include that office in their planning. So if we have a large number of ESOL students who apply, they could be taking up all of the seats and then not, a lottery would not be needed. So if, if there are more students who apply than they have seats, then the lottery would take place. But if there are not enough seats, then any, everyone would be accepted. For instance, Watershed currently does not have any ESOL students. OK, thank you. Any other questions? What is the timeline for, um, for them to, have a, to begin to identify a facility? That would be dictated by the contract and our next steps. For instance, after seeking some information directly from MSDE, we could put into the stipulations that they have to provide monthly reports. Um, we just need to make sure that they would have a facility in time to open by that September 2025 date. Okay. Or August 2025 date. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Rumpong. And we don't know how many students they're able to accept because they don't have a building. Yes, correct. Okay, so what is the what is the timing on that, or is there anything that's going to stop their movement forward until we actually know what type of building they secure and how many students they can have? So again, that is part of the contract process. Based on information on charter school regulation, we're not allowed to deny a charter school just because they don't have a building in place. So that would be part of coming up with those stipulations after either it is, <coughs> if it is approved, to move forward that way. Their intention, though, is to have two classes of each grade level, K through three, and then move forward with those subsequent years for K through eight. Ms. Dominowski. So did they have any buildings already in mind that they were looking at or that you know of or you're aware of? I believe they were looking, but there was nothing mentioned in the report about a specific building. Okay. Mr. McMillian. Or any of their leadership here tonight? Um, no, from Bilingual Global Citizens Public Charter School, no. If you could have one of them reach out to me. I'd like to talk to one of them. We, who, yes, we could, we could build, yeah, we'll, we'll, we can talk about that, Mr. McMillian. We could perhaps build that <laughs> agenda. Um, I have another question. Um, 
and I may have missed this, does the community want this school? Is there uh, interest from according, parents and? According to their report, they've been surveying the community for which they would like to have the charter school and are looking for a facility and they believe that there is interest. Also this would be, I guess, the only immersion, language immersion school in Baltimore County if it's approved. Okay. So thank you. Any other questions from the board? I think we've got them all. Okay, thank you. We're not scheduled to vote on this until April 16th, so there's some time. Okay, the second report is on Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School. And once again, I call on Dr. DiDonato and Ms. Kirk. Okay, so again, in accordance with BCPS Rule 1600, this presentation is a report and recommendation for the new charter school application submitted by the Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School. This time, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Kirk uh, to get us started. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. DiDonato. This slide summarizes the introduction and purpose component of the report. After receiving and evaluating the Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School Letter of Intent and related prospectus two years prior to their anticipated opening, the BCPS team evaluated the information based on BCPS Rule 1600 and after two submission iterations of the Letter of Intent, approved the organization to move forward to the application stage. After approving a one-day extension request to Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School, the application was submitted on January 3rd, 2024. After a technical review, a BCPS team of 23 content experts was convened to review the formal application. The final stage of the process included a one-hour virtual interview and opportunity to provide written responses to interview questions. Next slide, please. This slide outlines the qualitative review process. The team used the scoring tool for charter application, which is publicly available in rule six, BCPS Rule 1600 as Appendix D. As you can see on this slide, the tool has four main sections and 28 subsections. Next slide, please. This slide provides a summary of Section A, the overview of the application review. Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School proposed a school on the western side of Baltimore County that focuses on an inclusive and empowering environment for all students. This section briefly mentions the desire to have 12-month programming, uninterrupted work time, and a hybrid model. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. DiDonato to discuss Section B. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Kirk. Um, as the next three slides, again, will provide overall um, findings regarding the educational plan. The BCPS review team uh, noted an overall lack of detail within this portion of the application. Examples included there were mention of evidence-based curriculum and regular assessments aligned with MSDE standards without identifying and explaining uh, specific plans to implement the curriculum or assessments. Next slide. Continuing in section B, the BCPS review team noted a continued lack of detail related to the implementation of what the applicant mentions as a robust learning plan. While some professional development was identified, specific integration of the uh, professional learning with the curriculum was not clearly stated. The application missed the opportunity to provide details and context as to how the support will be offered to students, uh, special student populations. Additionally, the required third-party evidence-based research rationale for curriculum selection was not included except for a portion that included um, the identification of some intervention programs. Next slide. While specific marketing and recruitment strategies are not included, it's noted that the organization plans to hire a third party, Lincoln Beretta, to provide services in this area. A code of conduct and communication plan are mentioned. However, the opportunity was missed to provide details on the context, content and implementation of these plans. A plan for student participation in state assessments and or other standardized assessments was not included. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Similar to Section B, the BCPS reviewers for Section C noted an overall lack of details in the application for this section. The section was missing details related to uh, jobs and proposed evaluation frameworks, the professional learning communities, and professional learning communities. In the application and in the interview, Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy indicated a robust plan to engage with community partners to support students at the school. 
Next slide, please. The final, selection of, final section of the application review is the business plan. Budget, currents, budget concerns are primarily related to the funding of staff positions and an unidentified facility. One example of the concerns with the uh, staff position funding, the fringe benefits are, were seemingly too low for the salary totals indicated. Additionally, more details are needed with regards to uh, rent allocation um, and if that would be realistic based on the facility. Um, an opportunity was missed to describe the financial management procedures and identify a financial management system. The application did state that Puzzle Pieces Learning, Aca Learning Academy Public Charter School will participate in the federal school lunch program and adapt to the BCPS model in year five. There was concerns by the BCPS reviewers with regards to the feasibility of transitioning from a self-sustained um, food service program, self-operated system to the BCPS a system and ensuring compliance with uh, refrigeration and required uh, equipment. I will now turn it over to Ms. Kirk to discuss the interview phase. Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School was provided the interview questions three days prior to the interview. The order of interview questions was adjusted based on the request from the founder via email prior to the meeting. Overall interview responses left re interviewers with outstanding questions and concerns related to the qualities needed to create, implement, and sustain a su successful school. Examples are provided in the report. It was noted that the math curriculum was neither mentioned nor discussed in the application or the interview. More detail is provided in the report. During the interview, it was noted that the organization was no longer pursuing the facility described in the application and had yet to secure a facility I will turn the presentation over to our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. D. Donato, and Superintendent, Dr. Rogers, to discuss the recommendation. Next slide, please. So the recommendation from the BCPS uh, Charter Review Committee um, is that Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy Public Charter School was not recommended to uh, for approval to pursue a contract in BCPS because of the following reasons. The details needed to support a strong plan for creating, implementing, and sustaining a school were not included. The math curriculum and instruction lacked presence within the charter school application, um, which is misaligned with BCPS current priority areas. The English language arts curriculum and instructional descriptions were short of uh, really describing a robust instructional program for students in, in grades K through five. So board members, at the request of Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy, members from the organization would like to address the board for 15 minutes given the recommendation. So Ms. DeShiel, the founder, CEO, and president. Dr. Leslie Bovell, founding board member. Ms. Alice Cook, founding board member. And Mr. Leroy Smith, administrative and planning committee member, uh, may come up. Good evening, board. We are here today because we understand that we had some inaccuracies with the, with the application process. Just to give a little bit of feedback and background, our board is comprised of over 20 years experience in public education and private sector. We too understand that in coming from DC public schools and DC charter schools, your process is different. So there were some things that just were just misaligned as part of the process. So some of the inaccuracies were just not either recorded or not even pointed out as just. We're here because we follow and want to follow the MSD community schools model. That is our mission, that is our goal. We, we support whatever community around it. Our values are centered around project-based learning. We're also centered around SEL curriculum, and we also are centered around um, project-based learning. I will let my board members um, comprise and actually speak to some of the academic achievements. Sure, so we'll start off. Um, one of the recommendations that was made by Baltimore County Schools 
was around the ELA curriculum in which we said in the, I believe the capacity interview, that we were looking at foundations and the Wilson Reading Program, which are evidence-based programs um, through IES What Works Clearinghouse. Um, we also mentioned Eureka Math Squared, which was also a math curriculum that is an evidence-based program through Ed Reports. Um, these particular curricular um, components of our um, school will comprise of, and specifically for those who are not familiar with the Wilson Reading Program, it's been a program that's been used for decades, not only here in Maryland, but in Baltimore County Schools. Um, this program is a multi-sensory approach for learners who struggle with reading. Um, it includes uh, tapping out and phoneme segmentation. It also includes, includes comprehension components to support students with comprehension. The Eureka Math Program um, curriculum includes a focus on conceptual development mathematically, fluency practice, and problem solving that will increase students' uh, mathematical proficiency. It has been a, a program that has been used before in a neighboring county, Balt um, Baltimore City Public Schools. They used Eureka Math and Engage New York, which were aligned to the Common Core State Standards and transitioned them to the Maryland C College and Career Ready Standards. Standards, excuse me. Um, Additionally, we wanted to focus on the fact that the Wilson Reading Program also has a Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 component for all learners. So that includes small group instruction and one-on-one -on -one instruction for our um, most deserving learners who are struggling with reading. Good evening. I'm going to speak to the concerns around supporting the ESOL population or emerging multilingual students and their families. But we understand that um, EL students represent 16% of K-5 students in Baltimore County. We're going to, we plan to follow MSDE requirements and regulations regarding identifying students to place them in ELD programs. So that begins with um, whether students and families answer two or more questions on the home language survey. Um, saying that they speak a language other than English at home based on the answer to those to that survey, uh, administering the English language proficiency test, and providing the WIDA or alternative access K WIDA for kindergarten students. WIDA testing is in alignment with Baltimore County as well as the access for EL ELL testing. We will track data com to communicate with family, teachers, and other stakeholders. For academic, for academic support, we'll be employing ESOL teachers from the school and also offering opportunities for our teachers to obtain the Maryland Bilingual Certification. All of our teachers are going to be trained to utilize can-do indicators from the WIDA framework based on each student's test scores and listening, speaking, reading, and writing. We will be providing a language line for interpretive services and importantly, ensuring that all children especially our EL children, uh, receive the GT test in grade three, and that we are able to identify any potential special edu uh, education designation for EL students, because in the state of Maryland, EL students are just as likely to be students with this as the non-English speaking population, or sorry, the English only speaking population, excuse me. We will hire and um, train staff and best practices for emerging multilingual <coughs> students. Since EL students' test scores on grade three through eight state assessments are nearly four times lower than their heritage English and reclassified EL peers, we'll focus on teacher PD to support students in these subject areas, which are ELA and math. At Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy, we'll utilize a sociocultural participation perspective of our emerging multilingual students. This means we believe students bring competencies and use their resources in learning. Teachers will, should focus on uncovering and re supporting the resources students bring. This perspective builds on and acknowledges experiences and competencies of both multilingual and monolingual students. We understand, we know that we need to support our emerging multilingual students in class discussions and using multiple modalities of learning rather than just focusing on pronunciation, vocabulary, or lower level linguistic skills. We're gonna utilize instructional context that is language rich and requires both receptive and expressive, expressive understanding and allows space for students to use words in multiple ways. We believe that our curriculum choices reflect this. For example, um, I wanna reiterate the curriculums that my colleague 
um, stated earlier. These curriculums emphasize multiple ways of knowing and learning, group work, multiple models, like particularly with mathematics, that's really important, multiple models of mathematical understanding, and active learning. We also plan to implement the MSDE work group, the EL work group recommendation number three, which are the seven, seven sorry, 3B, which are the seven high leverage literacy strategies for EL students in our school. This includes incorporating the science of reading strategies and also innovative school models. And our school is a project-based learning model, which is an innovative school model. Thank you. So to add to this, we have already identified a building. It's located at 4416 Wilkins Avenue. We've supplied the documentation and supporting documents which were submitted today um, prior to the board meeting as well. We also did also to provide the board with samples of our lessons and curriculum. We also did answer to all the inaccuracies that Dr. Emmendorf identified in his nine page report. In saying this, we realized that some of the answers were insufficient, but we had the page, excuse me, we had a page limit that could not fulfill our complete detail of the requirement of the BCPS requirements. We admit to that our curriculum wasn't great, but we are willing to take constructive criticism and work collaboratively with, excuse me, with um, the school system and the board to resolve the deficiencies. We request an opportunity to cure these deficiencies prior to the board's final decision, according to MSDE's decision of the Da Vinci Collaborative versus Baltimore City School Board Commissioners. The school board is required to engage in a collaborative process, in addition to submitting follow-up responses, as we have already done for in the interview questions. These responses and the applicant to demonstrate that is excuse me, capable of fixing the deficiencies. The applicant must be provided with time to address the concerns raised in the recommendation. If the applicant had not been provided an opportunity to cure the problems, the local board should direct that such an opportunity be provided. <coughs> Dr. Bavel, can you speak to our organizational structure? Mm -hmm. So we have taken the recommendations that were presented to us, especially the sections of the governance that did not meet requirements, and we would like to resubmit with detailed job descriptions of all of the um, members of our staff roster. Um, we also would like to submit an organizational chart that depicts a real detailed and outlined structure of each role and responsibility within our organization. Additionally, we have robust and detailed plans for facilities management, financial operations, human resources. We have flushed out our PPLA staff evaluation framework in alignment with BCPS standards and MSDE using the CASEL model. We have gone into detail, and we did go into detail in our interview with um, uh, the interviewer for before for the um, when we initially met with the board, um, I don't remember what it's called, but we went through what our professional development and what our PLC professional learning um, collaborative networks look like, and so we propose our professional learning <coughs> communities to in that forum. Um, we also have presented and we restructured a plan that will better outline the professional learning um, communities across the board, as well as addressing what support for our teachers as well as teacher retention will look like overall from our recruitment and our retention plan that we have also um, developed. We also have a technology infrastructure to make sure that everyone has the um, technological capabilities that's needed to either navigate the school day or students to access um, information as required uh, during the school day. Um, so overall, we would like the opportunity to rectify what was missing um, because we have done the due diligence to go back and now make those corrections <coughs> or add to what the plans that were already established. 
And we just want to say in conclusion that, you know, coming into a system, you know, where uh, we come from where it's very structured. That's our background. We're used to things being recorded. We're used to things being being documented and things being aligned. And so we're trying to be flexible in the sense of that understanding that we don't, we're not in D.C. We're, D.C. operates totally differently. And so we want to employ that we are willing to collaborate and to get, to um, cure a lot of these deficiencies that, you know, the BCPS, Dr. Emmerdorf and Kate, Kersey Cake um, actually identified, you know, in their report. We just need the opportunity and the time and actually be recorded for us to know that how can we correct things if it's not measurable or if it's not identified for us. That's the growth that we actually teach our students. If it's not outlined for us, you know, exactly what we did wrong, how can we ever make change? And so that's the area and opportunity that we feel that it lacked. And so when we asked for additional, you know, we weren't being combative, we weren't trying to be difficult. When we asked for additional documentation of the audio and we asked for additional documentation of the transcript, Script. It was not to be combative or to be challenging to the school board or to, you know, BCPS. It was just to make sure that we aligned our responses to what we actually was, uh, that was actually written. And so we want to be able to correct those things. And so those are the opportunities that we actually wanted. You know, we, you know, puzzle pieces, I, I graduated from Mill for Mill uh, High School. I am a fan of Baltimore County Schools. I was born and raised here. I still live here and so this we we are this isn't a fly-by-night situation for us we are very passionate about the community we all still volunteer in our community we still give back we still work in the schools we work on the ground floor and I we feel that in more in who better to operate and own the school than people who have done the groundwork so in saying that that's our spill does anybody want to give any final thoughts from our board we just want to thank you for hearing us out yes. uh, tonight. Thank you. And yes. That, thank yes. You. Um, I also wanted to say this as um, a member in the community, um, that several of our students after the COVID-19 pandemic were identified with several behavioral challenges that we are seeing in our schools every day. And we have several members on this board that have expertise in supporting students who have these significant behaviors. Um, we have noticed that even in the BCPS data that there have been an increase in specific behaviors across the district. And with our programming, we can be able to support those students with our wraparound model. Um, and I just want to commend everyone in this process, the BCPS team, for evaluating the application and our board here for coming to you all because we truly care about our children because who else for our children but us? the mm -hmm. people who work alongside them and the people who have come through this wonderful school system. So we want to thank you and I want to thank my sister here and I want to thank our leader here because this is a challenging time that we're in for our students who are experiencing trauma and experiencing behavioral challenges and we're here to we're here and we're equipped to do something about it. You want to Allison? Dr. Bovell? We're done. That's it. That's okay. it. Thank you. At this time, I'll open it up to the board for any questions um, to either the Puzzle Pieces Learning Academy, uh, Dr. DiDonato, or Ms. Kirk. So I have some questions. Okay. <laughs> so we have one chance to get it right for our students. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at these charter applications, we are looking at are you taking advantage of that one chance to get it right? And so that is where my concern is, is that there was an opportunity to submit all this information initially. And it wasn't until you got back the it does not meet standard, does not meet requirement, that now all this information is coming up. So could you just clarify as to what ha what is that disconnect? Because we don't... <laughs> If, if practice dictates performance, we can't have this translate to our students. We understand. So the disconnect came into one, when we started this process, we, we there was the 150 page limit. And so 
that's one piece to it because in our understanding, if it's a 150 page limit and I'm already at 237 pages, I don't know because I'm not familiar with this process, I don't know if it's even gonna be looked at because I'm already over the limit. And so we had these things or whatever, we had these materials already created, already developed for our students. And so we just didn't supply them just because we wanted to follow the guidelines in your policy and procedures. Did anybody want to add? Additionally, I think um, some of the questioning around the third party um, tool to evaluate um, curricular resources was a little bit ambiguous. We were trying, we had asked a question about that early in the process before the application was e even submitted. So we can have full clarity about what that really meant for us in the application process. It wasn't until we had the interview that we were able to explain that we did look at those things after we received information and feedback after the application was submitted. Um, so part of this, um, the, the disconnect was that we wanted more clarity up front. And I think that's what uh, Mrs. Sheila is saying, is that it was hard for us to pinpoint some of those things in that application um, when some of the things that we had asked for up front were just not fully clear to us to fully answer. Um, so we tried to answer based upon what was given to us up front, and we also adjusted and maneuvered back to what we were recommended to answer for. And so I think that was probably the, the biggest disconnect is that we were receiving different bits of information along the way, and we were trying to respond to those bits of information as you were receiving the feedback. And even though some of these questions were asked up front before the application was, was submitted, we did not get enough information to adequately adjust the application to have all those things that were required initially. Thank you. And so any questions for the, for Miss, um, for our board of our BCPS central office staff. Okay. From, from us or from? No, from oh, the board. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Hinn. <laughs> and you touched on this, but I'd like to get a better um, sense of what happened during the application process. You mentioned MSDE requires this to be a collaborative process. Mm -hmm. What did that look like as you were encountering these questions, difficulties? Sounds very frustrating um, listening to you. So I appreciate your perseverance going through the process. Mm -hmm. What did that collaboration look like? And did you receive assistance from anyone within BCPS. Can you describe that process for us? Um, we didn't necessarily, I mean, if we did reach out to BCPS, they would try to provide us with some type of feedback, referring us back to the superintendent, you know, log of six, you know, rule of 1600, but that's at best that we would say that assistance lend to. Um, after that, we really had to like find out things on our own. And so we had to really learn a lot of things on our own. And so that took us actually, you know, building a lot of the community partnerships and community networks that actually have either been through the process, are familiar with the process, or know the process. And so that's part of where the frustration or I think some of the disconnect lied is that because of it not being very streamlined for us and we're used to it being very rote um, process that it just was, it was, it was a lot of, uh, like Mr. Smith stated, it was a lot of back and forth in understanding it because the confusion came into for us is that how can one pass or get approved for a technical review and then go through the interview process and then get a report with all these inefficiencies. It, it I would think that if, I, if we had all these inefficiencies, right, and we had all these issues, then why wasn't it brought up at the time of the interview? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one follow-up. When you did reach out to that, did one of the groups you reached out to include Watershed, given that they've been through this process? Yes, we actually successful. did. We actually did reach out to Watershed. Um, Jessie was very welcoming for me. She gave me. I met with her one time, and so she did give me some feedback and some guidance with some things. But her time is actually lim limited too because she actually is running a school as well. Um, but she did provide some some level of uh, feedback. We also did too uh, get the support of. Uh, I would just like to mention of 
watershed shade, she did um, provide some level of support for us this evening as well. So um, at this time, any additional questions we will um, we'll take through, uh, we'll have a written response. So we will um, take any other questions written. Um, and that's, this goes for both uh, this, for puzzle pieces and for, um, for the bilingual global citizens public charter school. So thank you. Thank you. The board is scheduled to vote on the two charter schools applications at their April 16, 2024 board meeting. Um, we're asking that board members do not individually contact uh, any leadership of the charter schools. You could submit the questions through um, to the board and we will ensure that they will, um, that you will receive a response. And so um, this will be, we will bring this up at our April 16, 2024 board meeting. Yes, Ms. Rimpong. Okay, so how is it said, write any more questions, and then who are we actually submitting the questions to? <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Rogers. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is information. The first item is the FY24 general fund report on revenues, expenditures, and encumbrances, budget, and actual for the period ending January 2024. The next item is the minutes of the January 22nd, 2024 Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting. And the last item is an update on key school legislation that, that has been introduced and presented during the session. Any questions about the information items? Uh, Ms. Dominowski? Uh, yes, I have uh, questions about the financial report. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at the, um, for the fixed charges, I think it was fixed charges, um, the health services non-salary, we were over, we're over budget by like 430% right now. What, what is the reasoning? What, is there like a main reason behind that? Um, I don't, and so, so you said it's in the health services area. I should, I should actually have the report in front of me. Yeah, but, well, I could have brought the computer up. Thank you. Let's see here. Um, yeah, it's for contracted uh, services. For for uh, the under health services, this would be contracted nursing services um, uh, that have exceeded um, ha have exceeded the um, the budget, but probably offset or is offset by uh, a, a, a under budget in salaries. So. And it, on a percentage basis, it's a very high amount, but the budget is small, so that's why it looks it looks large. But um, overall, in the category, we are um, more than half of the way through the year, um, and we're still th over overall 53% spent. So we're pretty much in line with where we should be. Okay, so this is for nurses, like. Yes, that's how that's the health services area is um, uh, in in effect is 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 nurses and anything that goes towards um, the the health of our students. The health of our so it would could it could not be like psychologists or no psychologists are not in are not in health services. Uh, they're in um, they're in student uh, student personnel services. So this is just. That's, it's uh, predominantly- Contracted nurses? It's contracted nurses uh, predominantly, without drilling, drilling into the detail. It's, um, I, I, I can't say every penny of it, but the, it's predominantly contracted services for nurses. Okay. Because, I mean, it is relatively small, but it's $1.3 million over what we budgeted for. So that's why it yes. kind of was a, a little alarming. Right. And we are bringing the bat in, in April, so that, that would get corrected in the bat. Okay, um, and then my other question was, oh, where'd it go? Do you need this back? <laughs> I think I do that one back. I think I, it's not in here, it's in my, my notes. Okay, um, 
under instructional costs, the workforce development program? Instructional costs. Um, okay. Number four. Okay. Uh, no, not other instructional costs. Number five. So it said that um, the increase in budget, so this one went over a little bit, it's already over a little because of the workforce development program. Um, what, what, could you explain that? Um, that is. That's not in there, here. Okay. <laughs> so, right, so Ms. Dominowski, you're asking questions about programs. So we could get a um, specific we could build it into the agenda to have a something like this, or we could send you um, information on it um, because a lot of that, what you're asking about now is blueprint related costs that have to be spent. Um, so that workforce development program, and some of this could, is just really a, a search. I'm looking through the budget um, where you could see that that work, what you're asking about is for the career navigators that are required by the blueprint for Maryland. So then that is state law. Yeah, I'm just asking questions of the document that was put in front of me without, that's all. So. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll put it on the next budget committee. Okay. Thank you. All right. <coughs> okay, the next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. First are committee updates. So for audit committee, Mr. McMillian. Uh, yes. The Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County met virtually on Tuesday, March 12th, 2024. The Special Education Dispute Resolution Audit results were presented. Additionally, Ms. Sherry Amos from Clifton Larson Allen presented the FY23 Single Audit Report. Both reports are posted to Board Docs and the BCPS website. The next Audit Committee meeting is scheduled to be held virtually on Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, beginning at 4.30 p.m. Please allow me the opportunity to make a comment that I think is so important that it shouldn't wait 28 days. Okay. okay. I want to quantify what I have to say by those people that know me know that I taught 35 years in Baltimore County Plus and Baltimore County Public Schools. Our schools are filled with, with thousands and thousands of really, really good young people that come to school every day and do their job and, and, and are prepared and listen to directives by, you know, the adults giving them the directives. They do their jobs. I had the good fortune to visit Kenwood on Friday. I met with Mr. Paul Martin, former principal and, and current consultant at Kenwood. It was not a dog and pony show. Uh, we walked around that building informally. We talked to teachers and students, and, and not teachers that were all, uh, ready for us. We walked into different areas. I wanted to go. We talked to teachers. We talked to students. We talked to school safety assistants. And, and that was a very pleasant experience for me. Uh, I, at no point in time did I feel concerned, threat, uh, unsafe. We walked around that building during the change of classes, and there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids in the building. And in those hallways, walking by, maneuvering what? And were they teenagers? Yeah, they were teenagers being teenagers. And that's what I like about them, because they have an energy that no other age group has. And so I, that was a very positive experience for me. And so those kids, all, they're all throughout our school build, uh, buildings, everywhere. And we often focus on the negative, you know, if somehow we could start focusing on the positive experiences. These kids that are doing so much good stuff, and we need to share that with everybody so that, that everybody sees it, including them. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that update on the audit committee, Mr. McMillian. <laughs> Budget committee, Ms. Dominowski. Yes, um, the meeting on March 13th was canceled due to lack of quorum. So our next meeting will be Wednesday, April 10th, where we'll be discussing um, the fixed charges and uh, finalizing our purpose and efficiency. Um, building and contracts is Ms. Harvey. Um, she's not in attendance. Curriculum committee, Ms. Lichter. Yes, our next meeting is on April 3rd. Um, I don't have the agenda yet. I'm meeting with Dr. DiDonato. So please look on board docs for the specific topics. Equity committee is Dr. Savoy. She's not uh, present today. So we will go to the legislative and governmental relations committee. Um, we had a we recently had a meeting where we reviewed the key leg school legislation, which is posted in the information section of um, board docs. 
We uh, are in the process of finalizing our uh, committee's purpose and effectiveness measures, and that is something that all committees are working on. We um, value the, the public transparency and, and accountability for ourselves, and so we are building effectiveness measures into our committee structure. So all committees are working on that right now, and um, we begin that work at our last committee meeting. Um, Policy Review Committee, Ms. Pumphrey. At our March 11th meeting, we did discuss our committee's roles and purpose, which will be presented later on. Um, and we do not have an April meeting, but our next meeting is scheduled for May 13th. Thank you. So next is agenda items. Board members, please raise your hand to indicate if you have any comments or items for consideration. Ms. Dominowski, and then we'll go to Ms. Lichter. I just want to again thank the um, Central Area Boundary Study Relief Committee for all their hard work. 19 schools is a large number of people to get together and make a decision that affects thousands of children. So I just want to thank you guys all for your hard, thankless work. Ms. Lichter. I don't know if this is an agenda item or just an answer to a question, but um, I hard to understand why we have board comment, public comments on policies and then vote on those policies on the same evening. So I just, could we take a look at, or I'm not sure what the rationale was when that was determined, but moving that so that what happened tonight and on previous occasions may be alleviated. Thanks. Thank you. Any other, <laughs> for Ms. Pumphrey then, Ms. Stileski. I think, I don't know if this is an agenda item or more of a comment, but um, the recent data from MSDA shows a huge increase in our student poverty, um, and that concerns me, obviously. Um, but also, we uh, considering our um, increase in numbers of community schools, we're going to be, uh, I think, very close to half of our schools are going to be community schools next year. Um, and also possible changes in litigation as far as community school model through the blueprint. Um, I, I think we may, may need to think about how we're going to address some of these issues of poverty. Um, I don't know if it's possible to talk about um, changing the speed of our needs assessment in community schools or possibly addressing the most basic needs during that needs assessment instead of waiting until needs assessment, needs assessment is over um, for things such as food insecurities, school supplies, clothing, very basic necessities that some of these schools now at this point that have an extremely high level of poverty, it's going to cause um, issues with their student achievement, which is our main focus. Um, so just something to think about. I don't know if it might be something for a possible agenda item because I know that we recently spoke about community schools, but considering these changes and increased numbers, it may be something that we need to bring back to the table. Thank you. Ms. Stileski? Um, on behalf of the Equity Committee, um, our next equity meeting will be Thursday, April 11th at 4 o'clock. Please join us. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hinn and then Ms. Frimpong. Thank you. I just want to um, thank our special educators for coming out tonight. Um, it made your day even longer than it already is. Um, you've been heard. We know we need to do better to take things off your plate and appreciate everything you do for our students. So thank you. Ms. Frimpong. Um, so it has been mentioned um, already as far as the boundary study and want to say a Great big thank you and kudos to the members of the boundary study. Um, change is never easy. Um, people talk about if schools are overcrowded, we need to make these boundary changes, but it is hard to go through the process, and especially when um, you are being impacted by those changes. Um, but some of the things I was super proud of that I saw um, and watching through the meetings were people not just coming at it from a perspective of how does this affect me, but also looking at others involved. So, um, you know, you had people talking about children who were had some poverty issues, um, race issues. There was even a gentleman with an accent. He was wonderful saying, you know, come to our school. Like, we love our community and we have space, so, so come on in. So it was a very, um, I think, just selfless um, type of process that the um, participants um, of this committee had. And so with that, with the welcoming environments, I hope that we continue that um, at the school level so that when these are actually made, um, not just school building leaders and teachers, but the parents and the children actually welcome the new communities in and help everybody to get adjusted to the change. So thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, and one last piece. Um, similar to what Ms. Lichter talked about with policy, I do wonder if we are able to, after we have a public hearing and we hear comments, 
we come right back to the next board meeting and we're supposed to make a decision. Um, but there was a lot of information shared today. We were able to make decisions, but it would be helpful, I think, if maybe we insert a board meeting in between that so we can digest all of the information um, and actually get statistics if we need to hear anything back from um, the Department of Planning, et cetera. There's time to hear that information and then make an informed decision. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us on this first day of spring. Um, so the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, April 16, 2024 at 630 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great spring break. The meeting is now adjourned. Oh, yeah.